Welcome to July's Tech of the Month in association with Garmin for all the latest news and reviews. This month we're going to be looking at the hotly anticipated Shimano 105 Di2 group set which has finally landed and we're also going to be looking at loads of new pro bikes which include the Trek Madone, the Giant Propel, the Colnago Prototipo, the Scott Foil and the Pinarello Bolide. And we've also got our Garmin giveaway so stay tuned for that. So first up, Shimano 105 Di2 is finally here. Now we were expecting it to get an upgrade but we didn't know what it was going to look like. We thought it could be 12 speed mechanical, could be Di2, turns out it's Di2. So I guess the first thing to really talk about is uh, what the differences are, what it's like compared to Altegra possibly. Yeah, well, um, the list of similarities is a lot longer than the uh, list of differences. Since, uh, as we say, it's 12 speed, just as Altegra and uh, Durace were. It's electronic and it's got the same half wireless system. And so uh, there's the option to um, not connect the shifters up to the main battery. You can uh, have that um, operating wirelessly with a coin cell battery. There's also the update to the braking system, uh, both giving a bit more clearance between the pads and the rotors, which is going to be greatly appreciated. That's a really good point, um, that update for Altegra so it's very good to see that uh, having been passed down onto 105 here. And there's also the update to how you bleed the calipers. And yeah, it's uh, such a source of frustration um, how it used to happen with um, the uh, little nipple that you'd pop the syringe onto and trying to adjust that with the, uh, with the spanner. Um, now those two bits are, are separate and so it's yeah, going to be a lot easier to uh, service uh, 105, which is great as 105 has traditionally been more of a workhorse group set. So usually 105 is heavier and cheaper than Altegra endurace. Um, is that still the case with the new one? It has definitely remained the same and so uh, this yeah, new 105 uh, Di2 is coming in at uh, about £1,700 whereas uh, the Ultegra with, without the power meter uh, was coming in at about um, £2,700 although that's still significantly more expensive than 105 Mechanical um, used to be which was around about £800 so it's a significant price increase um, above what 105 used to be but then it's also significantly cheaper than uh, the modern 12-speed Ultegra. I mean what reasons are there? to pay that much more money for the Altegra and the Durace now. Before we actually um, get hold of the um, group set and see how it feels um, in the hand and what the um, performance uh, actually is, just on the back of the um, specs, it really doesn't look like there's much of a reason to be um, going for Altegra and Durace with 105 so completely uh, emulating the, uh, the specs and the um, specifications of Ultegra and Dura Ace, and so um, yeah, 105 looks like it is the group set to have in Shimano's lineup now. Well, so last year we saw the launch of SRAM rival ETAP Access, and uh, that's going to be the direct competitor for 105, isn't it? Um, so I guess we need to really w work out how the prices compare. I mean. Rival is a bit cheaper, is it, than 105 still? Yeah, as you'd expect, um, the SRAM uh, does undercut the third tier. Um, SRAM Rival is undercutting on price, um, Shimano's third tier 105 offering, uh, to the tune of about uh, £500 um, in the round there. It's about uh, £1,300 um, for in yeah, certain configurations of a SRAM Rival axis. Another point of difference yeah, between yeah. the 105 and SRAM Rival is, uh, is the way that the batteries are integrated. And so with, with SRAM's offering, the batteries are on the derailleurs. Uh, whereas with Shimano, the battery is internal inside the frame. And there's pros and cons um, yeah, of both options. And uh, no, uh, I think no clear winner. Uh, it really depends on your personal preferences. And so SRAMS is easier to build with. You can just bolt the derailleur straight onto the bike, nothing to worry about. Whereas Shimano with the battery inside the frame, it lasts for longer. You get more range on a single charge, um, but then uh, you can't take the battery inside to charge. And then you also do have to connect up the derailleurs to that one central battery. Would you say there's any kind of crossover into gravel? I mean, gravel is a, a massive market now. Yeah, well, it's really interesting, actually, with the M105 and the new cassettes uh, that have been uh, launched um, with it. And I think it's quite an interesting point that um, Shimano's Jarex Di2 group set is pretty much, it's only slightly cheaper than this new Shimano 105. And so the price point is pretty much the same between 12-speed uh, 105 and 11-speed GRX Di2. And I think that uh, on, on the face of it here, uh, 105 is actually, I'd say, the preferable option now almost for gravel riding. It's got a new cassette which we didn't see in Ultegra and Dura Ace. And so this goes from 11 to 36 teeth. So we've got that wider range. And currently the widest cassette in the GRX range is only from 11 to 34 teeth. And that cassette doesn't have any single tooth jumps at all. Now I haven't seen the exact progression of the 11 to 36 12 speed cassette, but given that the number of single tooth jumps in the 11 to 34, 
uh, was almost identical to uh, an 11 speed 11 to 28 cassette, um, I'd say that, yeah, it's very likely that we're going to see these smaller increments uh, there. And so with 105, we're looking at a group set which uh, has a cassette with a wider range and smaller jumps between the gears, which is pretty much ideal. It's exactly what you want. The only point of difference is coming to the crank sets. And so uh, Shimano 105 then goes down to a compact uh, 50 to 34 tooth. Uh, chain set, which is a bit big for gravel riding, but I'm willing to bet that you could pop on a GRX uh, crank set with the um, Shimano 105 and be rolling along with a 4630 crank set and those 12 speed uh, sprockets out of the back, uh, which would be a pretty ideal setup, I think. Wow, yeah, 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 amazing. So, with the new 105Di2 costing £1,700 or, or thereabouts, that's £1,000 more than the existing mechanical one. So where does that leave the person who wants a reliable, cheap, mechanical build? Well, they're not going to find it with this latest update of 105. Um, if we take a contrast with uh, SRAM rival Axis, bikes with um, that third-tier electronic hydraulic group set, uh, they tend to come to about uh, £4,000-ish. We've got uh, Giant Defy behind us here, and yeah, Giant, uh, good value, good value brand. Um, but yeah, as we say, like still, it's around about, well, it's about... It's just uh, under 4000 Yeah, just under £4,000, yeah. but that's very expensive uh, still. And yeah, Shimano 105. Uh, for group set, um, the list price is £500 more expensive than the uh, SRAM rival offering. And so um, we can expect the uh, bikes to be, yeah, at, at least about £4,000, which, yeah, which really isn't uh, the everyman build that 105 uh, used to be. Uh, fortunately, the 11 speed um, Shimano 105 is going to continue being produced. And so there is still going to be that option. So you don't need to worry about on being forced onto uh, electronic group sets before you're quite ready or before <laughs> you've got uh, the funds uh, to, to make the move. Uh, so it feels almost as though we, maybe we reached the pinnacle of uh, performance and value with Shimano 11 speed 105, um, but then it's hard to uh, believe that um, there's not going to continue being improvements. So I think that we should maybe like, look around for um, yeah, what, what we could expect uh, down the line. And I think that Tiagra is the group set that we should really be looking at now with, uh, with quite a lot of interest. It's currently 10 speed and it hasn't been given an update in uh, quite, quite a long time. And so a move to 11 speed for Tiagra uh, does look to be on the cards. And if we can have Tiagra at 11 speed and hopefully at a lower price point than 105 was uh, at 11 speed, then this is going to be a really, really e exciting group set. And so I think uh, uh, the most exciting takeaway of this uh, 105 launch is what the future could hold for Tiagra and what price point we can see 11 speed uh, two by mechanical group sets being sold for in the future. Wow. So very interesting, fascinating stuff. So um, we haven't got a 105 Di2 group set yet. There aren't any samples available so far, but as soon as we do, we're going to test it, we're going to review it and put it through its paces and stay tuned for our review. So those two weeks leading up to the Tour de France are usually that period when we see unreleased bikes being ridden by the pro teams. And the first one that we spotted was a new Trek Madone being ridden in the first stage of the Dauphiné. Yeah, I mean, it was quite easy to spot, wasn't it, with that distinctive hole in the, uh, in the seat tube. It's yeah, really quite interesting what uh, Trek have done uh, with uh, that design. Um, it looks to be like they're taking advantage of the Venturi effect, which we've been seeing on uh, quite a lot of aero helmets these days. And uh, the easiest way to like, explain uh, how that effect works is, imagine that like, you've got like a hose pipe and um, the water's um, spraying out. You put your thumb over the um, top of it and the water comes out at a greater velocity. And this is what the, uh, the design, or at least um, we assume the uh, design, of that uh, cutaway in the seat tube is uh, trying to do. It's scooping up the air and accelerating it out the back. It's meant to be uh, slight, slightly faster and potentially also more comfortable as well. We're seeing a lot of bikes uh, these days, especially um, pro bikes, uh, leaning towards um, or thinking more of rider's comfort, um, particularly the um, Cervelo R5. And when you have that on test, I saw yeah, just leaning on the saddle with your elbow and, uh, the, and yeah. yeah, be visibly flexing. And so potentially with this um, setup, uh, Trek will be able to engineer more compliance into the bike which should make it uh, a little bit more comfortable and so uh, potentially faster. But um, yeah, this is just what we're going off uh, from, from the images here. We're yet to see the actual launch of the bike. So what about the rest of the bike? I mean, is it just a hole in the in the seat post, the seat tube, or is there is there, are there other changes? Well, from the previous model, and it's hard to imagine that the tubes could be made much deeper and still uh, fit within the uh, three to one ratio um, as stipulated by the UCI. But uh, looking at the images, it does look like they have managed to uh, make the tubes that, that bit thicker, that bit deeper. Um, quite have managed it. Uh, I'm not too sure. Maybe there was a bit more leeway than it appeared in the um, previous iteration. But yeah, the tubing is looking uh, much beefier, much boxier. Uh, presumably. Uh, 
uh, increasing the stiffness in those certain areas around the bottom bracket uh, particularly, and also presumably increasing the aerodynamics. Whereas the Trek Madone seems to be getting more aero with deeper tubing, the Giant Propel looks like it's going in the opposite direction, doesn't it? Uh, we don't have uh, so many details on the um, Giant uh, Propel. We've only seen it being ridden by uh, Tony Martin as a yeah, particularly gruelling uh, Norwegian uh, sportif that um, he was doing. But the Giant Propel, as you say, is very interesting. An aero bike that's uh, slimming down, and particularly in contrast with the Trek Madone. The tubes look to be a lot more slender. It seems as though Giant might be going for like uh, one bike um, for uh, doing both aero and climbing, which um, yeah, will be very interesting to see where that leaves the TCR. Is the TCR going to go along the lines of the AFOS and uh, shoo all out weight savings and no longer be kind of a bike that will be used so much in racing and is more just uh, for the like, weight enjoyment of a riding bike and that's just particularly light and not worrying about um, the aero performance. And so, yeah, it's yeah, quite interesting what this could mean for uh, Giant's range as a whole. I think it's the, the fact that Tony Martin was riding it for over 500 kilometers does suggest that it must be quite comfortable, which is not always a characteristic of aero bikes. I didn't see any obvious uh, changes um, to the bike uh, for increasing the uh, increasing the comfort, like no like decouplers or anything um, like that. But um, yeah, as, as we've seen, there's a lot that can be done with the uh, carbon layup and a seat post that looks like any other seat post um, can yeah potentially be uh, significantly more comfortable. And so um, yeah, I think that you're right that uh, the comfort must have been a high priority, or maybe uh, Tony. Martin is just so conditioned um, he'll be able to do <laughs> 500 kilometers on yeah, and literally anything. Um, but yeah, it'd be very interesting to see what Giant has to say when the, when the launch does come out. One new bike that we didn't see ridden in the wild in advance of the tour by Team DSM was the new Scott Foyle. Um, Scott kept that completely under wraps. We've seen the, um, the launch of the bike now, and so um, yeah, we, we've got the full details on uh, the new Scott Foyle. And it's quite interesting that uh, this is a bike that's um, going from being uh, the aero machine, you've got the uh, Scott Addict, which is the climbing bike, but um, it's been given a bit of a makeover to make it a little bit uh, lighter and a little bit more comfortable and still a little bit more aerodynamic than the previous iteration. Have Scott released any aero data to go with the launch? So in addition to a claim of being just 20% faster than the previous iteration, they have ever given some like, more detailed stats about the bike. And so Scott say that um, over 40 kilometers at 40 kilometers per hour, the new Scott foil is going to be one minute, 18 seconds faster than the previous Scott foil. And this is with a rider on board, so it's a complete system. What's actually quite interesting about Scott is that they've highlighted that there are certain tube shapes that they were looking at, which um, were very fast just on their own in isolation but once you put a rider on top, they actually turned out to increase the drag more than other uh, tube shaped designs. And so we're seeing this with quite a lot of brands with uh, wheel manufacturers as well, um, considering their full system. And yeah, Scott obviously has here as well. But it's very interesting to see that depending on how previous bikes have been designed, um, yeah, potentially uh, they're increasing the drag with their um, highly optimized uh, tube shapes. And it looks like Scott has um, yeah, paid a lot of attention uh, to this one with actual uh, wind tunnel testing in addition to um, the CFD. What's also interesting is um, the 9% lighter. Now, Scott has been quite coy about the actual weight of a bike, and so um, we haven't been given uh, a weight of the bike uh, fully built. Is it going to be right on the nose of the UCI weight limit? Probably not, but um, yeah, it looks like it's going in the right direction, at least, uh, without weight saving. So we're, we're speculating that the new Giant Propel is going to be more comfortable. Um, what about the new Scott Foil? Well, Scott have put a number on it. They reckon it's 10% uh, more comfortable, this new version. Quite how they've gotten to uh, yeah, a quantitative number of like a qualitative uh, sensation. I'm not too sure. But there's been uh, some quite interesting um, updates uh, here. And so with the seat post, it's uh, quite a thick, aero-looking seat post. But what they've done is they've uh, made a quite a big uh, cutout in the back of it. And so this is meant to help the seat post flex that a little bit more, like getting rid of all that uh, material. And in that void, in that space, they've got a integrated light. And so you can, yeah, slot that straight in it completes the shape so the airflow can be as optimized as Scott wanted and yeah then you've got a little integrated um, light which will be yeah I think quite a, quite a nice solution. In addition to that um, we've seen uh, bikes specced with wider tires um, with this being uh, Scott's uh, performance um, aero um, optimized uh, bike and um, there's um, a bit of a like an elision between performance and uh, comfort here and so a 28 millimeter tire is specced on the back and a 25 millimeter tire is specced on the front and so this is a combination we've been seeing quite a lot like people are choosing uh, this setup for the small leading edge and for yeah greater comfort um, at the back but it's quite unusual to see it um, as a dock option so an interesting development here from Scott. So yeah that, that so that's the aero and comfort at the rear and um, what about at the front end. 
That's really quite interesting what they've done with the handlebars. And so they've designed them uh, to be a bit more compliant, um, yeah, going over chattery surfaces like cobbles and rough roads. But when, when you're sprinting, especially for these um, pro riders putting so much force through the bike, uh, you don't really want to flex your handlebar so much. It's not an endurance bike after all. But uh, Scott Save have been able to engineer the, uh, the handlebars so that they're like, supple off the top for those chattery bumps. But uh, when you really start yanking on the handlebars, they uh, somehow firm up and um, become, become solid. I mean, like, we know about non utopian fluids uh, with like custard and ketchup you know they're yeah they run but when when you apply a force like yeah uh, they stiffen up with um yeah with the handlebars i mean a non-newtonian handlebar it's not a concept that i've come across before um, but it's gonna be yeah, really interesting to see quite how they perform and then on the back of a bike and um, to yeah, further increase the aero performance the seat stays uh, not only are they dropped they're said to be angled at a, a 10 degree angle and this is uh, supposed to force the air uh, going around the seat stays into the spokes and I'm not too sure on the mechanics on how uh, air being forced into the spokes is supposed to improve the aero performance. Um, Scott haven't uh, elaborated so much on how that mechanism works, but yeah, that's the design that they've gone with, and it's yeah, obviously testing faster for them. And so it'll be interesting to see if um, yeah, angled seat stays is something that we're going to be seeing yeah, slightly more of uh, on uh, more bikes in future. Sounds pretty interesting. Looking forward to riding the handlebar made of ketchup as well, I have to say. <laughs> So next up, we've got the Colnalgo Prototipo. And unlike some of the other bikes on this list, uh, we uh, got the launch before we saw it out in the wild. And so we have as much detail as we have possibly could on this one. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it's going to be the successor to the V3 RS, which is the one that uh, Pogac has ridden to both of his Tour de France victories. It looks very similar, but the tubing looks a little bit sort of, looks lighter. It, it still looks like the sort of all round aero bike that the V3 RS is, but it looks like it could be lighter. But the thing is that although Colnago told us about this bike, we don't have any weights. And that's because there are actually five prototypes that the team are riding and not just one. The reason for that is that they're testing different stiffness layups, uh, di stiffness matrices, they're calling them. And so, which is like different carbon layups. And they're gonna select a final one, which is gonna go into production and be the consumer bike. But that's pretty unusual, really, that they're giving a team five different bikes to race on and then waiting to see what happens, basically. Definitely. And so, um, does it look like that it's, uh, maybe there's the opportunity there for them to make it into more of like a sprinter's bike if they go for uh, one of the beefier um, layups. Where, where does the Conlago concept fit into uh, all of this? Yeah, I, would, I, I think we still don't know that either but I think you're, you're right that there is a, a beefiness issue here with it because it does have a, a bigger bottom bracket and that's something that Colnago have confirmed which suggests that it could be could be more suited to sprinting but I think it looks like it's going to be an aero all rounder bike still. What do we know about um, the design? Colnago is famous for its uh, lugged uh, carbon uh, designs but we've also seen uh, internal lugs now which look like a uh, monocoque from a distance so yeah what's going on here? So it is a monocoque but what's interesting is that they've used the new C68 which is not a monocoque this is the mod modular frame which is made up of the, the, the various parts. Um, they've used the C68 as a, a test mule, um, a bit humiliating for uh, the, the flagship bike. They've basically tested different parts of, the, of what would be the monocoque on the C68, so sort of swapped out bits of, with different carbon layups, uh, just to find out what works best, which is a pretty novel way of doing things. And the reason why they've done that is because it means that you can get results faster than making lots of different prototypes of a whole monocoque. You just test different parts of it and, um, and then you get results really quickly which is pretty interesting. Yeah, and definitely, I suppose, with the sort of more qualitative um, aspect to the design, like a lot of uh, brands uh, might focus on the, yeah, the shape you can put in the wind tunnel and sort of like really um, yeah, drill down into that. But um, yeah, coming up with so many uh, different um, iterations and giving them to the riders and seeing what the riders actually think um, rather than doing it um, like designing a bike by numbers. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. What, what's interesting really is that the, with this, they really seem to be focusing on the layup and the, and, and the ride. Um, which maybe is not surprising because that's what Colnago is all about. But we don't really have any details about the aerodynamics. All they've told us is that, and all we can see from looking at the bike, is that the front end looks a bit more angular, uh, that the head tube is a bit more sort of chiselled, and the, the seat stays where they join the seat tube, there's also a sort of little, uh, little sharper than before. But really that's all we've been told, that we don't know if it's, it's any better aerodynamically, um, but all we know is that they're testing these five prototypes and they're going to come up with the final one. Um, and it'd be interesting to see if they've decided which one Pogaccio is going to ride in the tour, or maybe he knows already. So this month for uh, our Garmin giveaway, we've got the new Garmin Edge 1040. So the headline stats are a more accurate GPS system and a longer battery life, up to 50 hours for the non-solar version and up to 100 hours with the solar-powered version. 
There's also an improved operating system, which makes the Garmin a little bit more intuitive to use. And there's also a clever pacing function, which will tell you what power to ride at, up the climbs and along the flats for the most efficient time on a particular loop. If you want to be in with a chance with winning this Garmin, then just click the link in the description down below and answer the simple question. So next up, we've got a bit of a change. We've got a time trial bike this time, the new Penarello Bolido. What can you tell us about it? Uh, well, not all that much actually, because uh, we've seen it, but we don't know any information. And we've seen it covered in a funny sort of sticker, sort of sticker paint job to uh, apparently to camouflage it, but also to uh, to make us really notice it. And uh, you know what we think is uh, well, we know that it's a brand new bike. It's completely different from the old Bolide. Um, it's got disc brakes for a start. It doesn't have those nice little brake covers, the, the fairings, which were a bit controversial at the time because they obviously weren't struck. For me, it's a little bit disappointing to see the new bike so much like a sort of time trial version of the Dogma, um, whereas as some, the previous one was sort of something on its own and was quite nice and sort of graceful looking. Really. Yeah, it was really distinctive, whereas now it's yeah becoming maybe a bit more of a oneness, but yeah. I suppose with aerodynamics being like, you know, so much at the forefront, I mean, there is uh, really only going to end up being like one fastest shape and so a bit of a convergence, I suppose, is to be expected. Yeah, I mean, they, they said that, you know, with the, the, the changing in, in time trial positions, I mean, if you look at sort of when Bradley Wiggins used to ride that bully day, you know, it's much flatter arms, now it's, it's more sort of like that. So obviously the sort of bike and the, the, the whole sort of uh, the flow changes. Um, but that, that's pretty much all we know about it at the moment. Geraint Thomas obviously is in, in pretty good shape and he came second to Remco in that uh, in the Tour de Suisse. Either that or the um, bike is just cunningly fast. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I yeah, guess we'll yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, so we're going we're gonna to find out uh, at the Tour. It's going to be interesting to see how that bike goes at the Tour. So that's it for July's Tech of the Month. We hope you've enjoyed it and uh, let us know what you think about the new Shimano 105 Di2. Are you going to be rushing out to the shops to buy it when it's available? And what about those new pro bikes? We want to know which one your favourite is, so let us know in the comments underneath. And if you like this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe. See you next time.